at Mark 2.6. Money, banking, and trust by moving titles in commerce. Featuring NTT, New Trust Technology. Presenting your host, Christian Walker. Welcome, everyone, to this Monday, July 12, 2010 edition of Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. Welcome to NTT Trust Ambassador Meeting. We'll do the disclaimer next. Take notice and acknowledgement with agreement that this show and or documents is private and not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for an individual legal situation or implored for making a legal decision. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure and is not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show and or documents are for academic informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. By accessing or reviewing this show or using the documents therein, you understand with agreement that with all rights reserved without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind for use by non-attorneys or pro se parties in the preparation or use of herein reference, and has no interest in any use referenced therein, and is not a party to this or any action arising from, and is only acting in an authorized capacity as liaisons to communications between the parties. By reading and or using this information, you acknowledge and agree that you are not a client of Christian Walters. These documents and our short recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached herein by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for admiralty commercial damages of $100 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walter's discretion. Thank you for your understanding. Again, I'd like to welcome you all to this Monday, July 12th edition of Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce and NTT as New Trust Technology. We switched to a new book in Corpus Juris Secundum. That's book 90 in CJS. And we're beginning on page 43 under section 169, subsection B, children generally. Page 43, section 169, B, children generally. Children as designating trust beneficiaries usually means only immediate offspring of the specified person Authorities differ as to whether and in what circumstances an adopted child will take. The word children, when used in trust instrument, is generally construed as unless the instrument as a whole indicates an intention to use it in some other sense. The words children and heirs are often used synonymously or interchangeably in common speech and the instruments containing trust provisions. The word children of a specified person or persons is used to designate trust beneficiaries only the immediate offspring of the specified person or persons is usually meant. The offspring of a common law marriage is included as a beneficiary of a trust in favor of the settler's children. Neither the grantee of the legal title whose children are named as beneficiaries nor a wife whose children are similarly named is a beneficiary under a trust for the benefit of his or her children. The express exception of one child by the settler of the trust in naming the beneficiary therefore may repel any intent of excluding any of the other children. Where the wife and the children are in the same situation, there is a trust in the wife and there is a trust in the children. Next subsection, children as class. The general language of a trust instrument may be such as to indicate that a gift of an income is not intended as a gift to children as a class. Next section, adopted children presumption. Whether an adopted child will take does not depend on the 
status as law, but on the intent of the grantor as disclosed by the deed of the trust indenture. Where a trust instrument is excluded by the adopted, adopted parent, there is a presumption in favor of an adopted child being included with children of the blood. When the instrument is by one other than the adoptive parent, it is a presumption against the adopted child being entitled to take. Other statements that are the word children does not usually include an adopted child unless it is manifest from the language of the trust and the surrounding circumstances that the settler intended to include such child. And that the general rule is that the word child standing alone, when used as referring to those to take in succession, does not include the adopted child of another unless it appears from the instrument itself or attendant circumstances as it was so in, intended. So it is held that the word children when used to describe it or designate trust beneficiaries will not include adopted children, particularly if the children referred to are those of a person other than a creator of the trust. Under a statute providing that the word child or its equivalent in a trust shall include a child adopted by the settler, unless to the contrary plainly appears by the terms of the trust instrument, the word issue as used in the trust instrument is equivalent to the word child in the statute. It has been held to, as to a particularly adopted status that they cannot be invoked to upset the provisions of a trust instrument. Two, times of which ascertain. Children in the trust indenture ordinarily includes only persons answering that description when the instrument is executed unless a different time is designated or intended. The word children used to de designate the beneficiaries in a trust instrument should ordinarily, in the absence of a contrary intent, be construed as including only those persons answering the description of the term of the instrument is executed, unless some other term, uh, other time for the uh, determination of the class is designated in a trust instrument. Thus, where the trust is created for one of his children, a court of equity cannot disturb, disturb the vested rights thus acquired. In order to let the afterborn child, in the absence of a testimony that the creator's intention was other than that expressed in the trust instrument, afterborn children may participate, if such appears to have been the intention of the creator of the trusts. At any rate, where no contrary intent appears, a conveyance for the benefit of children will not extend further than to include children in venery, say, mirroring. A trust provision in favor of such grandnephews and grandnieces of the settler are as are living at the time the trust instrument is executed and shall be living at the time the instrument becomes effective has been held not to include children born after the execution of the instrument. On the other hand, such provisions have been construed to include afterborn children. The mere fact that it is unusual for a man to take a trust in favor of a child, which his wife may have by another husband, will not of itself justify a court in de departing from the ordinary meaning of terms used in a deed. The word is manifest that the purpose of the grantor was pro to provide for the then wife and the grantee and such children as he and she then had or might have thereafter issued by the grantee from the subsequent marriage cannot take. Next section C, descendant or descendants. A settler's intention in using the word descendant is to be determined from the language used in the situation at the time of the executing the, the instrument. Descendants and issue have been held interchangeable. The intention of a settler in the use of word descendant and untrust instrument is to be determined by the language used in the situation existing at the time of the execution of the instrument. In the construction of the instrument using the word descendants and the word issue have been held to be interchangeable. Where the trust is created in personality, the meaning of, and the non-resident settler's intention in using the word descendants and in a provision that the trust principle on the name beneficiary's death shall pass to a surviving descendant, if any, and if none, to the settler's descendants, must be ascertained by applying the rules and principle sanction for the construction of the trust indentures by the, tr uh, the courts of the state in which the trust personally is located. Next section, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Whether the grandchild, children of a, or great grandchildren of a settler are, are beneficiaries depends on the language of the trust. Where the language employed do not convey the idea that the creator of the trust used the word child or children in other than an ordinary sense, it will not be enlarged so as to include grandchildren, but in a proper sense it will be so construed. Under the trust instrument directing the payment of income to lines of the creditor's children or survivors thereof, the grant, the creator's grandchildren 
could not participate in the income during the lives of their parents. The language of a trust may be such as to show the intention of the donor in, to include his great-grandchildren as well as his grandchildren as the objects of his bounty. But where the word child is used with reference to grandchildren, it does not include a child adopted by a grandchild several years after the trust instrument becomes effective. The issue as excluding grandchildren is discussed in for section F of this section. Next section E, heir, heirs, other heirs. Unless the settler intended otherwise, heirs in a trust instrument is presumably under its in technical sense and may be construed to mean children. In considering a trust instrument where the word heirs appears, there has been presumption that the word is used in a technical sense or in a strict and primary sense, that is, as denoting the whole of the in indefinite line of inheritable succession. When the word heirs is explained or uncontrolled by the context, the words are interpreted according to their strict technical import. However, the words heirs will not be given a technical meaning as the word of art if the settler's actual intent requires otherwise. The word should not be construed as a word of purchase unless it is clearly used with that intent. As used in an instrument, in a trust instrument, the word, in its strict and technical sense, applies to persons appointed by law to succeed to the estate in case of intestacy but is frequently used to designate those persons who answer this description at the death of the testator. Ordinarily, it is a word of limitation. The words children are often used synonymously or interchangeably in common speech and in instruments containing trust provisions. So heir and or heirs, when used to designate parties to a trust, may be construed to mean children, it appearing that the creator used the words interchangeably. Likewise, the words heirs, when so used, may be construed to be include an adopted child, particularly under general laws of inheritance, making adopted children heirs of the adopting parent. Legal heirs, in a conveyance to the specified person of trust for his legal heirs, may be construed to mean children. On the other hand, the words heir of the body, in particular circumstances, have been held not to include children of the grantor. Under provision in a trust instrument directing the trustee to execute a deed to the heirs of a designated person and such shares as would have received had the designated person died, owing the property and fee, simple, the terms heirs fixes the class of those who would take as grantees. In the absence of the words of the, in a trust instrument restricting the meaning of the words heirs to those who are heir in one line of inheritance, the word will not be given such restrictive meaning. The circumstances may be such that the governing intent in determining whether the particular person can take as an heir is that of the persons to the trust agreement designated to supersede a will and not that of the testator. The word legal preceding the word heirs is of no consequence in construing the meaning of the word heirs. Distinction from the next of kin abolished. Since our written trust agreement relates to the devolution of the property rights, it comes within the purview of the statute abolishing the distinction between heirs and the next of kin in any written instrument prescribing the devolution of the pro property rights. Such a statute has been held not to be retroactively effective, so as does not apply to an inter vivos trust created prior to its enactment. Next section, assumptions that the settler's knowledge or intent. Where a trust provision for distribution to the heirs of life beneficiaries, it can be assumed that settler realized the lines of inheritance may be changed. But it cannot be assumed that the intended that the class of heirs would be enlarged beyond blood relatives or the statutory equivalent or adopted children. Next section, other heirs. Where the settler having children and grandchildren declares a trust be for the benefit of his grandchildren on certain conditions and for a specified length of time, after which the property is to be distributed among his other heirs, the term other heirs has been held to refer to the settler's own children. Two, times as of which ascertain. Unless the instrument reveals a different intent, the person's death is ordinarily the time as of which his heirs designated as trust beneficiaries are to be determined. While the death of a person ordinarily is the time at which the heirs are to be determined when designated as trust beneficiaries, this is a rule of construction only and has no application where the instrument under consideration clearly reveals that the creator intended that his heirs should be determined as of some future date. So the determination of the person's heirs as beneficiaries of a trust may, when such appears to be the intent of the creator, be postponed to a spe specified 
point of time subsequent to the death of such person, a trust for the benefit of the heirs of one body does not, in the absence of an apparent intention to the contrary, include afterborn children. Next section, F, issue. Issue is designating trust beneficiaries may include children, although authorities differ as to whether it includes adopted children. It is excludes it excludes grand, grandchildren. The word issue, when used to designate trust beneficiaries, may be construed to mean children being used primarily as an antithesis to parent. It is only secondary by way of representation that the remote issue are embraced by the term. The word may include children born after the creation of the trust. The effect of the word issue appearing in one part of the trust has been held to be cir uh, circumscribed by the use of the word children in another part. The word issue has been held to ex exclude adopted children, and this has been held to be general rule. But the question is essentially one of intention, which may be gathered from the construction of the entire instrument and an examination of the surrounding circumstances. A statute may have the effect of making issue include an adopted child, and a lawful issue has been held to include an adopted child. The word issue include, excludes grandchildren, particularly where the parent of a grand, grandchild is a beneficiary and may exclude children born of a subsequent marriage. The intention of the settler that the word issue still have a less extensive meaning than descendants and that the issue is to be applied only to the particular descendants at the particular time and may appear from the trust instrument where the word issue is used in a trust deed, meaning descendants, they take sturpies and not per capita. A statutory definition of the word issue as meaning lineal descendants has been held by its terms to relate to the descendants of the state and intestate and not to pertain to the interpretation of the deeds of trust. Next subsection, time as which ascertain. The ascertainment of the lawful issue of a person designated in a trust instrument need not await the death of the designated person. A trust in favor of main beneficiary and issue will not include afterborn children. Next section. Next of kin. Next of kin in a trust instrument means the statutory next of kin. The term standing alone cannot include heirs at law. The term includes an adopted child, but not a widow. The term next of kin when used in trust instrument has been held to mean statutory next of kin. The term when used to designate parties to a trust cannot, when standing alone, be held to include heirs at law. An adopted child of a designated person is included as a beneficiary under the description of his next of kin, but the widow of a person designated is not included, particularly where the trust instrument indicates that the phrase next of kin is to be construed in accordance with laws of inheritance, which actually do exclude the widow. Kindred is to be construed as next of kin. Next subsection, times of which determine where it should class of beneficiaries described as the next of kin of a settler, the class must be determined as of the death of the settler unless the indenture plainly indicates otherwise, so that the words heir at law and next of kin may be construed in the context as describing those persons who shall be the donors next of kin determined at the day of the termination of the trust. Where the trust provides benefits for a mother and her son, with remainder over to the latter, latter's next of kin, and the son predeceases his mother, the next of kin are to be determined as the date of the mother's death in light of the indications of intent disclosed in the trust instrument. Next section, H, persons in particular family relationships. Where the designation of a trust beneficiary involves or requires a particular family relationship, such relationship must be shown to exist in order to qualify as beneficiary. Beneficiaries under trust created for the benefit of members of a family are only those that actually sustain the family relationship. Such a trust for the support of a specified person and his family contemplates that as a beneficiary a son before he has attained his majority, but not afterward, nor does such a trust include a married daughter who has attained her majority and is living with her husband apart from her father. On the other hand, it has been held at a trust for the support of the settler's wife and the children of the marriage includes the same children after that after they have attained their, their majority. Both husband and wife off after proper parties beneficiary of the trust established for their support under the trust for a benefit of a specified person and his wife to be used as they need as they might need it. The wife is a benefit. Wife is a beneficiary with the husband while he lives and the sole beneficiary after his death. 
In construing a trust in considering a trust instrument, the rule has been applied that a gift to the wife of a married man refers to then wife and not to the one whom he may subsequently marry. So under the trust for the benefit of a specified person for his wife designated by a proper name in the trust instrument, the subsequent wife of the person specified is not included as beneficiary. A divorced wife is not contemplated as beneficiary under trust for the benefit of a specified person and his wife and their children as a family although a subsequent wife of the a specified person may be substituted as beneficiary. A trust for the benefit of a designated person with a remainder to her children and the issue of any of her deceased children does not include the widow of a deceased son who predeceases the designated person and, no, and left no issue. Next section I, settler as beneficiary. According to the indicated intention, the settler may or may not create the trust primarily for his benefit and may or may not be the sole beneficiary. The court will ascertain for the intention of the settler whether the trust was created primarily for his own benefit or completely disposes of the trust fund and occasions with vested remainder in certain beneficiaries. The fact that an instrument creating a trust does not disclose that beneficiary does not necessarily make the grantor the beneficiary. If a settler manifests no intention to grant a beneficiary interest to anyone else and he is the sole beneficiary, but one who creates the trust is not the sole beneficiary if he manifests an intention to create a vested or contingent interest in others. The settler is the sole beneficiary of a trust where he transfers property and trust to pay the income to him for life and on his to convey the principle that he may be deed that he may be by he may by deed or will appoint. Although it is provided that the default of appointment, the property shall be conveyed to his heirs or next of kin. A deed conveying property and trust for sale for prices let, let to me has been held not to make the settler the sole recipient of the proceeds in view of direction therein for payment to others. J, next section, survivors. Qualification as a trust beneficiary by way of survivorship, as in the case of a widow, requires conformity with the terms of the trust. In the absence of a provision in the trust instrument to the contrary, beneficiary is designated therein as those who survive in a specified class or those who survive specified persons are construed to be only those who actually survive the specified class or person. Thus only as those who, those who survive other children in their class may take as beneficiaries under a trust for the benefit of surviving children. A wife from whom the settler was divorced should, before his death, has been held not his widow within within the meaning of the trust provision for specified payments from trust income to his widow, naming his then wife as such widow. However, under a trust agreement providing for the payment of income to the beneficiary's widow, the beneficiary's second wife, whom he married after being divorced by the wife whom he was married when the trust was created, has been held his widow after his death. The trust in favor of the widow of a specified married person should she survive him does not contemplate one who becomes the widow of such a person by virtue of the marriage contracted subsequent to the execution of the trust instrument. A trust instrument may be so worded as to make provision for a designated person, but only if she survives as the widow of the settler's son, and not to provide for any widow that the person may leave. The language of a person instrument, excuse me, the language of a trust instrument may be such that the surviving wife of the deceased grandchild of the trust of the trustor is not held to take under the instrument. Words of survivorship in referring to the beneficiaries and instruments creating a trust in person property refer to the period of division and enjoyment unless there's an intention to the contrary. Next section, 170, nature of trust. A trust is properly construed with reference to its nature, which has been held determinable from the trust instrument alone. A trust is properly to be construed with reference to its nature. The inherited character of a trust and its own essential limitations may form an element in the construction to be give, given the language creating it. It has been held that the nature of a trust is to be determined by the instrument evidencing the trust and by that alone. But as appears super section 165, A, it has also been held that the parole evidence may be introduced for this purpose. Next section. Conditions on implied trust. If a trust is implied in law, 
These conditions can be prescribed by the donor only. Next section, 171, trust executed or executory. Trusts are ordinarily construed as executed or executory in accordance with the definitions of such trust and the party's intention is a controlling element. Trusts are ordinarily construed as executed or executory in accordance with the definitions considered, supra section 16. That is, trust may be regarded as executed if the limitations in the trust are fully and perfectly declared by the creator and as the executor where the limitations are imperfectly declared and the creator's intention is, is expressed in general terms, giving merely a general plan or an outline to be carried out more or less in the discretion of the trustee. In other sense, whether particular trusts are to be construed as executory depends on whether something is left by the trust to be done by the trustee, or in other words, whether he has some duty to perform under the trust. Next section, intention. In determining whether a trust is executed or only an executory one, the intent is at the time of the creating, it is an important and controlling element. Next section as determining application of rules of construction. Whether equitable or legal rules of construction of, shall apply to the particular trust may depend on whether it is executory or executed. Thus, in construing executory trust in the sense that such trusts are imperfectly declared, the court will seek for and effectuate as far as possible the intention of the creator and will apply liberal equitable rules of construction. But in construing executed, uh, executed trusts, the controlling in inquiry will not be intention, but the legal operation of the terms employed in the instrument creating the trust. Next section, 172, property included. The property to which a trust attaches is determined by the intention or purpose of the creator thereof and is evidenced by the trust instrument. In ascertaining the property to which the trust attaches, the intention of the creator of the trust as evidenced by the trust instrument controls. In other words, the usual test is the manifested purpose of the creator. The intent of the creator of a trust is, as to the property, to be included in the trust estate may be ascertained from the punctuation used in the trust instrument. And in the ascertaining that intent, the court may be aided by the construction of the trust instrument placed thereon by the acts of the party. But if it is sought to the aid the instrument by inf inferential description or by allusion to another instrument, that instrument must be offered as in evidence. A deed of trust may be held to transfer for the purpose of the trust all possible claims of the trust door and the property conveyed, but it has also had been held that the title or to Title to a claim for damages arises from dealings with trust property before the creation of the trust is not included as part of the trust estate. Property in which the settler has no interest cannot, of course, pass to the trustee or beneficiaries, nor may a trustee impress a trust on property by setting up on his books and reporting it to the court as belonging to the trust estate. Any use in the form of a trust or otherwise given without limitation as the time is is taken to construe, uh, constitute a gift of the principal or corpus as well as income of its subject matter, whereby a trust agreement between a husband and wife, the survivor is to have the use of the other property or estate for life and then to bequeath it to the heirs or descend, descended, not only such property but as defined, ascertained, becomes subject to the trust. Whether it is a conveyance of real and personal property to the use of life or a particular person who is also vested with the right of use, con consumption or disposition over the personality, there being a remainder over to specified persons, the trust property does not consist of the personal property as a corpus to be preserved for the remainder men, where in a declaration of trust, a trustee, after agreeing to transfer certain land to a specified person, also agrees to convey business conducted as part of such premises, the conveyance of the business does not include an interest in the land as part of the trust estate other circumstances which particular property has been held or held not to be included in trust are set out in the note. Next subsection, construction unnecessary. Trust instrument which clearly designates the trust property and the interest therein intended to be conveyed leaves nothing to be construed but will pass exactly what it purports to convey, no more and no less. Next section, as of what time included, addition of fund, addition to fund, 
a trust deed conveying all of the creator's property af uh, affects only such property as was owned by him at the time of the execution. So also a specif specific trust on land devised to only does not attach to land afterward bought by him. No trust in an after acquired real estate results from the contract which is intended to be the terms as to the exact interest which should be held in trust. Where a trust instrument provides for the settler has a right to amend the terms of the agreement and adds to the trust fund. Additional funds and securities added by him constitute part of the trust fund and do not belong to his estate after his death. In particular circumstances, a trustee has been held to acquire title to a lot under deed of trust, although the grantor completed his title thereto after he executed the deed. Next, granting clause rectals. Where the granting clause does not identify the property rights assigned, the rectals in the trust instrument must be referred to in order to determine that question. Next section, buildings placed on land. In the absence of any agreement to the contrary, buildings placed on land and becoming part of the freehold are equally affected by the trust of the land. Next section, restrictions to life estate. In the absence of an intent to the contrary, a trust for the benefit of a specified person for life may be limited to the life estate. Thus, where a trust instrument conveys certain property for the benefit of a specified person for life with the power of appointment with a specified person at his death, the trust thus created is limited to the life estate and the specified person, where, however, the instrument creating the trust for life either expressly or by necessary implication provides the trust shall extend to an interest in a remainder the trust shall be construed to include such a remainder. Thus, where by an antinuptial agreement made prior to the enactment of the Married Woman's Act, a woman conveyed certain property for the benefit of herself or life with a remainder over, the trust extends to the remainder. Next subsection, the records, documents, and account books, which a trustee procures so that he can perform his duty, do not belong to him personally, but are parts of the trust estate. B, proceeds and investments, income. Whether proceeds or income from or investments of a particular property are included within the operation of the trust is determined by the will or intent of the settler and the language of the trust instrument. A provision of a trust instrument that proceeds of a sale of realty or personality shall become part of the trust estate has been held a sufficient expression of the settler's will to require that such proceeds shall fall into the corpus of the trust notwithstanding the proceeds may exceed the appraised or estimated value of the item at the time the trust was created. A deed of trust conveying a parcel of property, part of which has been appropriated by the municipality, does not carry it with the money paid by the municipality for the appropriation and satisfaction of a judgment there or recovered before the execution of the deed of trust and on the sale of the estate held under the trust for the life tenant remainder to his heirs the fund resulting from the sale is not subject to the trust, it being merely the consideration received for the life of state and the remainder man having no interest therein. Where the creator of the trust invests the trust fund in land for the purpose of the trust along with the funds invested by another person for the same purpose, the entire amount so vested is impressed with the trust. Where the funds are contributed and conveyed to a trustee for the benefit of the family of the city key trust on an issue between the trustee and prior credit uh, creator of the city key trust who attaches the property it is proper to instruct the jury that if the property levied on was the product of the business contemplated by a deed of trust representing either the original capital or the profits thereof the title would be in the trustee next section income a benefit of the income of real estate by way of trust will be considered in a proper case as a gift of the property itself but the principal will not be applied when to do so would do violence to the settler's intent and plan. A general gift of income arising from the personal property, making no mention of the principal, is equivalent to a gift of the property itself, where no limitation of time is placed on the payment of the income and the principal is not otherwise disposed of, where there is a gift of income under an individual's trust without limitation of time, express or implied, there is a gift of the entire beneficial interest. Next section, capital gain. It has been held immediately becomes part of the trust corpus of the trust. Next section, 173, purpose of trust. 
a trust instrument is, be, is to be construed so as to effectuate its purpose, which is ordinarily or primarily to be de determined from its terms. A trust instrument is properly to be construed with reference to or as to carry out or affect its purpose, purposes, object, or objects. And when the manifest purpose sought to be accomplished is ascertained, it will be taken presence over all canons of construction. In the absence of unequivocal stipulation to the contrary, no provision of a trust agreement should be read so as to defeat its purpose. The purpose of a trust must ordinarily prime or primarily be ascertained from the terms of the trust instrument, construing all the provisions together and the parties that are not at liberty to say that it has a difference or narrower purpose than that disclosed in the instrument, nor may a court go beyond the purpose of a trust as expressed in the trust instrument. The trust instrument will be construed as authorizing all acts within the use contemplated to effectuate the object of the creator of the trust, and if necessary, equity will extend the trust as created and will take such other action as necessary in order to effectuate the purpose or object of the creator. In particular cases, equity may, if necessary, even act in opposition to the provision of the trust in order to carry out the ultimate purpose of the trust. However, a trust established for the purpose of paying an annuity will not be construed or authorized a reimbursement of the creator who may have paid the annuity out of unmuted and the trust provision of the purpose of paying the beneficiary muted at his death will not be construed to authorize payment of such debt during the beneficiary's life. Next section, general scheme controls. In ascertaining the purpose for which the trust is created, the general scheme of disposition of more significance than mere form, mere forms and phrases employed in the trust instrument, hence where a conveyance of property and trust is equally susceptible of either of the two interpretations, it should be adopted with which carried out the main purpose of the donor, the best given effect to the general scheme, had in view by him. However, for this rule to be applicable, it is necessary that the trust must be sustainable of two interpretations. In any event, the court will not construe the trust instrument in such a manner as to put the settler in the attitude of nullifying the evident purpose. Next section, effect. Where a trust is created for a specific purpose, it is so limited that it is not repugnant to the rule against perpetuities and is in other respects legal, the trust property may be dealt with only to carry out the appointed purpose. Next section, the purpose of the trust for support is to be furnished to the beneficiary the means necessary for the personal substance, education, and physical comfort. Next section, 174, priority between declarations of trust or between trust or other transfers. The first of two trust declarations in favor of different persons but with respect to the property prevails where the party's rights are equal. First of two declarations of a trust in favor of different persons but with respect to the same property will prevail where the rights of the parties are equal. If our property is included in a second trust deed, which was not included in the schedule accompanying the first trust deed, that property passes under the second and not under the first trust deed. Where a husband and wife conveyed land belonging to the wife to the trustee and trust to self for the use of the grantors, the land being unsold, the trustee is not entitled to hold it as against a subsequent bona fide mortgagee who, without notice and satisfaction of the debts due him, from the husband before the mortgage was executed. Next section B, the state or interest of trustee and city key trust in general. Section 175, nature of a state in trust. Where a trust is valid of such a nature that the statutes of uses and similar statutes do not execute the use, the trustee is the holder of the legal title, and the city key trust takes the equitable state or beneficial interest. Where a trust is valid and of a, such a nature that the statute of uses and similar statutes do not execute the use, the trustee is holder of the legal title, and the city key trust takes the equitable state or beneficial interest. The beneficial interest under some statutes being not an equitable title, but merely equitable right to enforce the performance of the trust is considered infra, section 180. 
where the uses executed, the legal and equitable states unite in the city key trust, as discussed in FURA section 176, and where the trustee and the city key trust are identical, there is no estate of any sort outside of the latter under a statute which encumbers the purpose of which the trust may be created. No legal title passes to the tree if the trust created for other purposes. At law, the trustee is regarded as the real owner, and his name must be used in any action or proceeding affecting the title to the trust property. The city key trust can assert states only in a court of chancery, unless statutes provide otherwise. The beneficial estate or interest of the city key trust is subject to the same incidents, property and consequences of the estate and interest. No person but the trustee or one claiming under him can set up his legal estate against and echo the city key trust. The interest of a beneficiary is not encumbered by the trust estate, nor is it a claim which is adverse to the trust but is that part of the trust estate which goes to the beneficiary after encumbrances on the trust estate or valid claims against the trust estate have been paid? It has been held that the nature of the estate created by the deed of trust is determined once and for all at the moment of the legal inception of the trust deed. Section 176, Operational Statute of Uses and Similar Statutes. By reason of the statute of uses or like statutory enactments relating to trust and uses, a dry or passive trust is executed, vesting the legal title in the beneficiary. The English statute, section 27, Henry VIII, section 10, commonly called the Statutes of Uses, was enacted to remedy the evils arising from the separation of the legal and equitable estates. Common law resulted when a trust was created, the object of the statute being to unite both the legal and the equitable states in the steady key trust and to divest the trustee of any title or interest whatever, although it may be latter been held, been reenacted and modified in the various states of the union, it was adopted as part of the common law in a number of states, but in others it never formed part of the common law. By reasons of the statutes of use or like statutory enactments relating to trust and uses, a dry or passive trust is executed, vesting a legal title in the beneficiary, and this is true when an active trust becomes passive, but such statutes do not execute a use or trust in which the active duties are imposed on the trustee. Such a statute does not operate for an implied resulting or constructive trust, but only on express trust expressed by the parties. The three essential things to bring in a state within the operation of the statute or a person sees to a use, a city key trust, and a use in being in possession or remainder. If the city key trust is not in being or capable of being ascertained, the statute will have no operative force until such requirement is fulfilled. And so the statute will not execute a springing or shifting use until the members of the beneficiary class are finally determined, nor will it execute a use in an undisclosed beneficiary. The statute of uses does not operate on a use limited on a use or a trust of personality, but is held, has been held that the common law does for personality by way of analogy what the statute does for realty. When estates are conveyed to trustees for benefit of parties taking different interests, the statute may execute the use in one and not the other, depending on the trust, on the duties of the performed uh, duties to be reformed with respect to each estate. Next section, merger of legal and equitable estate. Under a passive or dry trust, the whole legal and equitable estate is merged and vests immediately and directly in the beneficiary. And he is entitled to the actual possession and enjoyment of the property. The season and possession thus transferred is not a season and possession in law only, but is actual season and possession in fact not a mere title to enter on the property, but an actual estate. The city key trust may convey the estate and pass a good title without the intervention of the trustee, or he may be called, on, or he may call upon the trustee to execute conveyances of the legal estate. Next section, conveyance of legal title. Under passive or dry trust, the beneficiary can call on the trustee for a conveyance of the legal estate, and if refused, may compel it by bill and equity and may maintain ejectment 
for the recovery of the lands in his own name without a previous conveyance from the trustee with respect to such estates on the doctrine that which ought to be done is regarded as already done as discussed in equity section 106 whenever equity would decree a conveyance the legal title is treated as already conveyed next section void use the statute of uses will not execute as part of a use which is illegal and void and for it would have nothing to operate on Next section, when objects of a trust are defeated, the statute of uses will execute the trust. Section 177, active trust. The rest of the active trust is that with respect to the control, protection, management, or disposition of the trust property, the trustee has imposed on him some active and substantial duty to perform or useful purpose to subserve. For a trust to be active and or is essential to the interposition of the trustee may be uh, to be necessary to carry out the valid purpose of the trust and test being that with respect to the control, protection, and management or disposition of the trust property, the trustee has imposed on him expressly or impliedly some active and substantial duty to perform or useful purpose to subserve or has by valid virtue of his trust obligation some discretion to exercise such as the investment or reinvestment and care of the property or raising a certain sum of money for some prescribed purpose for the income of the estate or the receipt or payment over of the rents income profit or proceeds of the trust property to or for another with remainder over or the preservation of the estate for those in remainder or the protection of the estate for a given time or until the occurrence of a certain event or the conveyance of a trust property to the beneficiary or beneficiaries after a life estate or the happening of some specified event, or the sale of a property and use of the proceeds for some prescribed purpose, such as distrib distribution among beneficiaries, the trust is active until its objects are accomplished or until the trustee shall have completed the last act of duty imposed by the trust, even though the city key trust ends are authorized to direct and control the action of the trustee and also to remove them and substitute others in their place. Next section, duty to convey, where the only duty remaining is the formal or ministerial duty conveying the estate. The trust remains active until the duty has been or may be presumed to have been performed, but there is also authority holding that title will vest in the beneficiary without the formal conveyance. Next section, maintenance of estate for married women until this coverture a trust for the maintenance of a separate estate for a married woman is active if there is a pr purpose to be accomplished or the trustee is, has active duties to perform. Under the Constitution or statutory provisions permitting a married woman to hold a separate estate that as a time, as a femme sole, a trust merely for the purpose of holding the legal estate for her has been held not to impose an active duty but under the statute would enable the married woman to hold property to their separate use but does not permit their right of disposal to be absolute and unqualified and which contemplates expediency in some cases of the intervention of a trustee, the trust may be an active one. Postponement of the performance of the duties of a trustee until a certain time does not render an otherwise active trust a passive one. Next section, 178, passive trust. Trust in which no duties rec recognized as active are imposed on the trustee or trust which serve no purpose that could not equally be served without a trust have been held to be simple, passive, or dry. Trust in which no duties recognized as active are imposed on the trustee or trust which serve no purpose that could not equally be served without a trust have been held to be simple, passive, or dry, and all of the most expressed words of trust are used, no estate or interest passes to the trustee. Other than, other than at most a mere naked legal title, which may be terminated on application to the court by the said key trust. If this nature is a trust merely for the use and benefit of the named beneficiary or beneficiaries, the only duty of the trustee being to hold the title, no trust being specified, or one under which a trustee has no power of, of control or disposition, the sole use and control being in the beneficiary, or a conveyance of land and trust for purchases, or a trust for a married woman's separate estate, where the statute makes a wife 
as to her separate estate, a femme soul, there being thus nothing left to the trustee to do as considered supra section 177. Likewise, the trust had been held to be passive, where only a duty was to permit the beneficiary to receive the rents and profits, or merely to receive money and pay it over to the beneficiary, or to pay the taxes if the beneficiary fails to do so, or to give notice to the life of beneficiary uh, after forfeiture of the estate to the remainder man. An active trust may become passive when the purpose of the creation has been fulfilled or the trustee has no further duties to perform, in which case the trustee estate ceases. Thus, where an estate is given to a trustee and trust to pay the income to the person for life and at his decease merely to hold the property for the use of another named person, the trust ceases on the death of the life tenant because its purpose have been accomplished. And similarly, a trust for the sole benefit of children under which the trustees are charged with no functions except to hold the property for the children becomes at the maturity of the children a dry trust. Next section, conveyance by trust, trustee of passive trust. A trustee of a passive trust cannot convey title to the trust property without the consent of the beneficiaries unless the deed of trustee, unless the deed to the trustee does not disclose the city key trust. Section 179, effective invalidity of use or trust. As a general rule, in the absence of statutes, if an attempted trust is invalid, the property is unaffected and it remains as part of the grantor's estate. If an attempted trust is invalid and the property unaffected and remains in part of the grantor's estate and the title is not conferred on the trustee or on the beneficiary, but where the consideration for the trust has been paid by beneficiaries, title has been held to vest in them, and under the statute in which a grant in trust to convey lands is not a purpose for which the trust estate is authorized, although it may be in a, a power in trust, as considered supra, section 25 through 27, and the title to the property vests in the person to whom the conveyance is directed. Next, Section 2, Extent of Estate or Interest of Trustee, Section 180, page 68. We will pick up there next time. So let's go to Q&A. Press star 6, star 1 to get in the queue line. Raise your hand. Uh, state your name and where you're from. Press star six, star one. <clears throat> Christian, this is Floyd. Hey, Floyd. Um, I'm trying to help someone with uh, their um, trust uh, problem. And um, I know that Mike had said that you had given instructions on, on – uh, uh, on, the, on the tape, it was, he said it was 75 Mark 206 tape. Um, I'm not too sure if I have that tape, for, first of all, but anyway, uh, I, I, I think I was on the call, and that was uh, something was said about when we are going to um, go into um, declaring a breach of trust and uh, I, we have to we have to enter into the uh, court on a colorable uh, situation or case or whatever you want to say, and and we have to uh, put enough in there to show that it's in equity. And there was uh, five points that um, I know that you brought out. Uh, and number one was this is a a suit in equity. This is a plea of special matters. This is a counterclaim, no adequate remedy at law, uh, appropriate equity uh, maxim. We have to state the uh, maxim for that particular um, case that we have. Um, my question, uh, I guess my question is uh, how to form this um this writ or whatever it is that you call it. Uh, that's if you, if you have a Black's Law, look in Black's Law under uh, Bill and Equity, and it'll list nine things, and basically those comport comport to those nine things there. Uh, so I don't know if you had affidavit on that. That was another one. Oh yeah, and you're right, and and, and an affidavit. I haven't <clears throat> I haven't written an affidavit so. Um, 
could I, uh, is there some way I could get some help on that? Uh, well, we're kind of working on that, so, you know. Well, uh, she has to put something into the court tomorrow, and I'm not quite sure what to put in because what the situation is right now is that they had sold her house, and she's and she came back at them, and she put all of that in her trust res, and they haven't done anything until just now, and now they're now they're going to move to to get her out of her house, and I was wondering what exactly would you do to. Um, to to uh, put the skew on that. Come back in name and come back with the counter suit and put a, a restraining order against that with some new kind of charges that uh, must be settled first and heard first. Like unjust enrichment. Something like that. Uh, any kind of cause of action that would uh, stop the thing that must be heard. And you have to probably put in a. a a, a temporary restraining or something claiming irreparable harm. Okay, temporary restraining order. Uh, irreparable harm, okay. Would that be, uh, would that reparable harm be something that um, would be available uh, in, in the um, the, what would you call that book that has the, the forms? You'd have, to, you'd have to go to the law library and, and do uh, a research on the temporary restraining order. Okay. <laughs> the elements, and then uh, it'll tell you what elements are necessary for your local rules in your state. Okay. Well, she's in um, she's in Idaho, and um, of course I'm in Virginia, so. So she has to go down to her law library and look up um, the temporary restraining orders and what um, and what conditions have to be met. Is that what it's called? Well, there's certain elements under uh, uh, every cause of action, and usually the guidelines when you do the lookup of the cause of action, it tells you the elements. And then you got to check your local rules because sometimes they've got some local rule changes also. And there's usually like a temporary restraining order, like four or five different elements in there necessary to, which are the SOIs attached to your NOI, that they have to be there to get the, uh, the TRO action. And by the way, the temporary restraining order is an equitable action in equity. So you want okay. to, you want to, you know, this is a suit in equity and the same thing, kind of like what you're doing right there. Okay. <laughs> to invoke the equity side. And you want to make sure that you're claiming a right, and the right is that's being damaged or, or being irreparably harmed, is she has the right to property, real estate in possession, and a right to real property, equitable interest. Those are two rights. And remember, equity only uh, gives remedy to a relief to rights. So you got to claim a right. So she has a right to property possession, and she has a right to real estate equitable interest. Okay, so she's got a right to property, and she's got a right to real estate in possession. Yes, with equitable interest. With with equitable interest. Okay. And that All equity right, no. term is the equivalent to the public side value that she has in the property, which has nothing to do with the private side equity. It's just, so that's a, a play on words that you have to know the meaning of the duality of public versus private to get that. Okay. All right. Um, hmm. Well, uh, I'm not quite so sure as, as to why she has to have it in tomorrow, but um, she's going to have to. I wonder if she's going to be able to um, get to a, uh, a library, a law library, and get all of this done and get it in at the same time. Uh, yeah. What if, What if she's late? What happens? Uh, what is the deadline? They're selling the house tomorrow. Well, I'm not sure. She said she has to get something into the court tomorrow, so uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. Um, 
because all I know is that I told her that she was going to have to do something in uh, to get into uh, equity. Uh, it's going to because she has to go through the um, the colorable side of the court and to get into the equity. I knew that. But I wasn't quite sure um, what what to have her put in at this has point. The house sold. Has the house no, I mean sold. Uh, well, the house the house is supposedly was sold, and uh, she did something, and I. Uh, um, oh, how long before. ago? Oh gosh, it's been probably sixty days anyway. All right, so maybe she's fighting right of redemption or something, money out or. Uh... Yeah, she was working. She was working debtor creditor, and then I told her to take everything and put it in trust. Everything that she had done, I told her to make that her trust res, and um, and and put all of that in in uh, in trust, uh, and um, and 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 then write out her and then write her indenture, indenture and uh, have them have her uh, have them pay the uh, pay the bill or whatever. Well, it sounds like what she's fighting now is what is called a writ of possession, where they want possession of the property, and they're going to throw her out of the house when they serve her, and they go give her 24 hours or whatever the law is, according to her state. It could be three days. Okay. Uh, but I would say what I could do would be to get another tenant in there and then sign an affidavit that they are tenants, and if the sheriff came to serve her with the papers, you hit him with the affidavit, and then they must go back to the paperwork has to go back to the plaintiff to tell him that these are tenants in here and not the homeowner. Because usually when they did the foreclosure, the judgment contains a writ of possession, and all they have to do is ask for it, and they probably got it, and they'll throw out the homeowner out on the street, but they won't and can't throw a tenant out on the street. And you can claim that in federal law, that if you've got a lease, you can stay in the house to the the completion of the lease. Okay, so then if she gets another tenant in and she gives them a year's lease or something like that, then that would buy her that time, right? Yeah. Okay, get another tenant in. I wonder if she can get a tenant that fast. She's living in the property? Yeah, she's living on the property now. She needs to like take a a border in or something and get a lease. Okay, um, that that would be that would be kind of a a, a quick uh, a quick fix then, right? Yeah, temporary stop gap, yeah. And then okay. you can work on the paperwork to come back in on the uh, at law side of the court and maybe get the judgment uh, reversed or vacated or uh, there's a, there's a lot of things you can do at law. So, okay, so get another tenant in and create a lease, and then uh, you, and and you say that that sounds like they're coming at her with a what was that again? A writ of possession. Writ of possession. Okay, I'll ask her if that if that's what it is. Uh, she probably won't know because if she's served, she's only got like 24 hours or 72 hours to get out. Okay. All right. Well. Um, so just in case that they do have a writ of possession, then I'll tell her to get another tenant in there and uh, create a lease with them, and uh, that'll put a stop to, to to them throwing her out then. Yeah, and then look up that federal law that says that the, they have to honor the completion of the lease. And then that party would have to make payments to the uh, party that's the property. Otherwise, they would uh, then probably start eviction against that party. But then that they're guaranteed at least 90 days. So that party could still stay in the in the, pro on a, the property for 90 days without making a payment before they would even be allowed to take the eviction action proceedings. Okay. You need to check out that federal law. Okay. Um, what is that? Is that that's a USC? Nah, uh, you need to do a Google search. I forget what it's called. Uh, landlord tenant something. Uh, it came out uh, I think last year or early this year. I don't remember what it's called now. There's a federal law that uh, 
just Google it and do some research. You'll find it. It's there. Okay. There's a website so, so that about 30 pages worth of material. It explains it all, and it gives you the forms to even use. Okay. All right, so it, it would be a landlord, um, tenant, um, federal law lease uh, that you, I would look up. Yeah, some kind of key words, you know, foreclosure. They can't, uh, it's the landlord tenant foreclosure law, something like that. I forget that was what they call it. Okay. It's a federal law. Okay, landlord foreclosure, federal law. Okay. Okay, I'll try that. I'll I'll, um, I'll ask her if um, if what they're trying to do is uh, well. I'll I'll get more particulars on it so I know exactly what that to see what we're what we're doing here. Yeah, what she what she's been doing all the time. Yeah, she's been living there for um, well. Huh? Living there, what has she been doing legally to protect herself? What is she been oh, doing? Her at, well, at first she was doing a debtor creditor, and they and she wasn't getting anywhere with them. And so then when she started listening to you, um, then uh, she she didn't know ex exactly what to do. And so when I when I started to go after Sprint, then um, she she modeled her um, uh, indenture uh, after mine. And, um, and and asked them to uh, uh, commanded them to um, uh, extinguish the debt. So well, did she make a payment according to debtor creditor, like with a lien or something? Um, she probably did. I, whatever whatever Patrick was 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 telling was saying at the time. That's what she was trying to do. Okay. Okay. Well. And so. Uh, Payment has been made. That could be a cause of action to come back in with. Say, you know, where's my payment of an application to the debt? Mm -hmm. I'll I'll ask her. If she made a payment in, under debt or creditor. You know, and then, and everybody doesn't realize there's two sides running simultaneously. You can do a private side set off, closure, whatever it was according to, her, uh, except for value and such. But you got a public side that doesn't. Uh, keep on, it's going to keep on closing you down and complete what they're doing at, uh, coming at you with until you give them something that they can see that's going to stop them and make them pay attention that they have to do something otherwise. Uh -huh. so you got to control both sides of that public and private in some, yeah. some respect. Yeah. Well, I told her that whatever she had done, just take that and make that her trust res, and then put the put it in as trust. Yeah, it doesn't work if you make uh, if you settle the private side, whatever methodology you use, and then all of a sudden you say, uh, well, you know, how come I got foreclosed on and threw it on the street? Well, it's because you didn't do anything with the private with the public side. I think, get yeah. The public side to witness what you did on the private. If you don't, they're not going to stop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, and which is probably easier for a lot of people would be to strictly on a litigation basis, you can you can win against these people. Strictly litigation. Uh huh. Where's the okay. name? Where's the holder and ownership status? Where's the uh, uh, the uh, chain of titles? If you know what you're doing in court, you can you can win. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, not really I'm not really strong on mortgages, so I don't know, you know, what I'm doing on mortgages. But uh, anyway, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to help her out uh, as far as the trust part of it was concerned. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah, well, well, no matter what she does trust or what she does, you still have to have some kind of stop on the yeah. public side. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll see. Um, I'll see if I can help her out, and um, maybe Floyd, I can. Floyd, you there? Yeah. 
Um, CW, I have a question in regard to this. Doesn't if she he does a lease, doesn't he have to non pro tunk that back at least three months? Uh, could be. Yeah, you may be right. Yeah, that's where yeah, she had. Yes, yeah, where she yeah. had the property. So, yeah. Yeah, if she has a daughter or something, just have the daughter or sign it in a pro tunk, you know, three months back, and that's it. Mm hmm Okay, I'll uh, I'll see if she has anybody, but uh, she's 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 widowed now, so she's not really. Um, I don't know if she has any family close by at all. I don't know what in, in that regard. I I don't think she does. Well, something to think about. Yeah, I'll see if she has a friend or something that she could do that with. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try and get a hold of her and, and get back to you, and, and maybe tonight, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another another option she might have is uh, she might want to file uh, federal bankruptcy. Okay. If they haven't taken possession, then she can still remain in possession with the federal bankruptcy, I believe. Yeah, I think they they have to leave. They have to let you have your house and and uh, and a mode of, of transportation uh, in bankruptcy. Well, I'm I'm talking about the stay. The automatic stay is you know in a place, and that just stops everything. What would she do? File the bankruptcy tomorrow? Yeah, you could, but I think you have to have like that little course you got to take for so many hours, and that can be done in one day, and uh, pay the filing fee and make out the papers. Yeah, you can do that very quickly. I see. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, that's two. That, that's two uh, ways to go then, just just to keep them from uh, hauling her away, dumping her on the street. Right. Okay. Okay, I'll uh, I'll try and get a hold of her and then um, see what she what what she thinks she can do. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. I'll, I'll probably get back to you tonight and if, if if she gives me more details and see what's going on. Okay. Thank you. All right, Corey. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Carlos, you're unmuted. Good evening. Can you shed any light on that? I'm sorry? Can you shed any light on that? Yes. Go ahead. I can, be I can barely hear, but okay, here it goes. Well, actually, on the um, – can you hear me fine? Yes, you're, you're coming in loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I wanted uh, this gentleman to call me. I got a nice shortcut, make it a lot easier. You're right on the money. But uh, I think I have a I can have a better shortcut, which is the same. But here he, uh, she doesn't have to go through a lot. It's uh, a little more easier for him. He can uh, he can Skype me. He knows my Skype name, Trust Law, uh, capital T, capital L, on Skype. And also on the, uh, the basically what I would do in in this gentleman's case. Floyd, right? Yep, that's Floyd, yeah. Yeah. What I would do, I would just yes, send them a copy of the lease. They don't ask you for anything else. Just send send whoever's trying to, whoever's sending the letter, uh, the uh, notice to quit or however they call it in the county, send them that uh, that uh, lease, email it, email it to the sheriff if the sheriff's server with uh, them or her with any documents. I email them every day and, and also fax them. They never bother. After the three after the ninety days, they waited another month and then they, they told this this uh niece of ours, you have to move out by the eighth of June. So on the first of June I filed bankruptcy. And now she has a, a court date in August. So and she was they sold her home in December, so 
she's been there for at least eight months, nine months. Mm -hmm. and, and we're fighting back. We're fighting back. And uh, I have a real good strategy, which I already mentioned before. But uh, to make uh, make her feel happier, because I know I'm more comfortable and uh, a little more relaxed, because I know this is very stressing, even for Floyd, who is trying to help. Because we stress out. Uh, somehow they, they transferred the stress uh, to us, but it's fine. I guess that's why God puts that in here, right? Anyway, it's uh, real simple. Floyd, uh, go ahead and, and uh, Skype me or email me at prosperforless at hotmail.com. I have that at least. It's real simple. You'll do it in one minute. Send it over. Do it the way they did it. And, and they'll, 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 uh, they'll stop for about three months. They'll come back and then file bankruptcy. That's what I would do. I'm not telling him to do anything. File bankruptcy. And then now he can come back and then by then she'll be ready to merge titles under bankruptcy and we should be able to help her more by then. Uh, Christian, you and I are going to be a little stronger in that bankruptcy, uh, NTC, emerging titles, uh, getting bankruptcy as a backup to fall back and, and, and any, any, everything, finalizing everything uh, under NTC, which I think is going to work out. Now, I would like to address what you were reading on the book, mm -hmm. on the, uh, on the book that you were reading. It most, it most talked about trust, right? It's it sounded like an interview with trust. It sounded very familiar to me. What you were reading, very exciting. Okay. It sounded uh, about what I heard you talking about. It sounded about estate planning and asset protection. Okay, which is a living trust with a beneficiary. And one of the things that that it was every, a lot of people was trying to do that land trust, and they says, well, now we're talking about another trust. How can we join them, or what is the proper way to do it? What I do, and what I like to do, is convey the property into a land trust. I don't own it anymore. The land trust owns it. Good. Now the beneficiary is going to be that trust you were talking about. You have double protection. Uh huh. I mean, that's that's the best way to do it. And one more thing, we all should have a living trust, obviously, right? But the trick, and I've been to many, many seminars in this, this uh, church put up these seminars that free uh, asset protection seminars and free uh, living trust seminars. But what I, they don't tell you, I mean, obviously they want to do everything for you, which is fine. Business is business. But they'll charge you $1,800 to do it. But they don't tell you the trick of the trade. You have to have one for your wife and one for yourself. You're going to have in that, in that uh, living trust her assets, and she's going to have in her living trust, your assets. That's the trick. Yeah, the cross. I think that's very cool. That's, that, that is very cool. But everything that you were saying on the uh, what you were reading, most of, most of the evening that you read pertains to a trust, entity, living trust, land trust, asset protection, estate planning, which is one family. All right, I guess that's it, Christian. Okay. I just wanted to throw in my five cents in there. <laughs> but it's great. Very exciting. All right. Thanks, All right. Carlos. Appreciate Thank it. Thanks. Okay. Next call. Hello. 718, you're unmuted. 718. 718, you're unmuted. Okay. 805, you're unmuted. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, great. Good evening, Christian. Um, so for the public side, it's basically the counterclaim. That, is that basically you're filing the counterclaim on the public side, right? Counterclaim. Uh, wait a minute now. <laughs> what, what, where are we at here now? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, uh, I'm not talking about mortgages. I'm just talking about a, a court case. When you're, you're basically you're filing a pleading special matters, and you're also you're, you're filing that in the public. Uh, with the caption set, and you're also filing your counterclaim in the public. Is that correct? Counter counterclaim is when somebody comes at you and they got you in court already, and then you come in and you counter with a claim. Right, and and that's filed in the public though. That's you basically. It's kind of like answering their claim by making a counterclaim. You basically address the points by. Yes, it's by, like you're 
saying that I owe you money, and then in my counterclaim, I come back and say, well, I've already paid it. Right. You just ledgered the, the thing correctly. Do you, uh, do you put the facts in there? Do you, do you address it like points and you, you file it in the public for the caption set and a public counterclaim? And you just send the caption set, it's just a uh, counter defendant, counter plaintiff. Yes, without giving your private remedies, uh, your private stuff, putting it on the public side. Right. So you're basically just kind of addressing the points. You're rebutting the assumptions essentially with your counterclaim, but you're really not giving the actual payment until you're in chambers. Yeah, you come in with the NOIs, but on the public side and the counterclaim, but then you got your SOI, your material facts, you know, to substantiate, especially if it's private, then that's, that's in the private. Right. So the NOI is a, a public filing is your counterclaim and it's in the public. You file it and it's basically just rebutting all the assumptions. Well, there's and an they, NOI on the private side. There's an NOI on the on the public side. There's an SOI on the, the uh, on the private side and there's also a colorable SOI on the public side. Okay. Everything's a mirror. Uh, Everything is a mirror. Yeah, it's all a mirror. Okay. Also, if you if you're seeking damages. You put that into your you put that into your counterclaim, obviously, right? Well, how much damage is you're seeking, or uh, irreparable harm, for example? If you're seeking damages. That's going to give you a remedy at law, and that will probably block you from equity. Well, okay, not not damages, and like I said, irreparable harm. Okay, the irreparable harm is a NOI pointing to a right, which is an SOI. So you got to come up with a right to claim that's being taken away from you, which puts you in equity automatically then, because it's a right. So is your your right to property, obviously, and pursuit of happiness, I mean, those be considered your rights? Yes, any kind of right. Right. If you can prove a right, then you can get into equity. Yeah. So... Okay, so I guess I'm just concerned with the public filings. That's really the first step is getting those public filings in and then going into the private. You basically, your public filing. I know there's public and private, so, but you start out in the public if you like it or not. So your first filings are essentially addressing the public and, and putting yourself into equity in the private. Yes, and making it colorable enough on the public side without giving away your private substantive rights. Right, right. So you and you basically once again your two public filings are pleading special matters and your counterclaim. Yeah, because that uh, pleading special matters that's a switch for equity. Right, that's that's basically the the trigger to get it into equity. But at the same time, you're also putting putting in a counterclaim because that's what you're addressing in the private. Well, you want to what 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 uh, Floyd was talking about? We was talking about those seven things, or maybe a couple more. But, uh, but those nine things in Black's Law. Under uh, bill and equity, yeah, that's what you got to have, and that's in your public pleading, right? That's in your pleading special matters. Yes. Is the bill and equity the actual counterclaim? It's the actual bill and equity. It's not. It's it's. So you have, you've got two basic pleadings. You've got a pleading special matters, and then you've got the bill and equity, which is your counterclaim. It's your NOI, your public NOI. Go to like your your rules of your state and look through the rules and you'll find a section in there called pleading special matters and you'll find that breach of trust is usually under that section along with fraud, omission, mistake, yeah. breach of performance, yeah. and that pleading special matters that's all equitable. Yeah. Okay. So like if they've taken away, let's say. Uh, a business entity that the business is dissolved. That would be basically pleading, you know, uh, they've taken away or it's irreparable harm because they've, they've altered the course of your existence or your situation, your income it's and your, your right to uh, own a business. And well, contract. Your right to contract. You get the contract stuff. <laughs> That's debt of credit stuff. There are no contracts. There are credit. Right. Yeah, sorry, excuse me. No substance, no contract. Yep, can't have a contract. If we don't have contract, then what we got? We got a trust. Right. So, but okay, I guess uh, I was kind of referring even like the Constitution. You don't even pay attention to any of that because that's their laws. That's not our law. Yeah, that's U.S. fiction stuff. That's yeah. That Constitution's for them, not me.
Right, you got it. All right. The Declaration of Independence, that's got all my unalienable rights. Just the, de that's yeah, the Declaration of Independence. That's the original indenture, correct? Yes. So, and then I guess the Constitution would almost be like the, uh, the Siskite Trust almost. It's a sub-trust. Sub-trust. Yes. But the, the corporation was established with the DLI, and that's basically pre-corporation actually. Before the corporation yeah. was established. That constitution is a benefit benefit they're giving you. Right. I don't want it. Right. Got it. I don't like the obligation that goes along with it. Right. We just want our substantive rights. That's um, not what we want. This is what we we have our right to. Our un, unalienable right is our substantive right. Yeah, but I have to like get there by going backwards and coming around again. I got to do it backwards because that's really the right way. We've been trained. We've been trained backwards. Yeah. And we've got so to stop we, the way to get to where, which seems backwards to us, but it's really the right way. Well, yeah, just like uh, last claim in, first claim out. Yeah, you have to go into the assumption that everything I know that I've learned in this world is all backwards. Yeah. Everything's backwards in Babylon. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's uh. I'm getting clearer every day. It is like, you know what's funny? It's like, okay, so public law, public policy is totally brainwashed us. And then so then we learn debtor credit, and we're thinking, oh, okay, well, this is really how it is. And then you're like, well, that's really not how it is either. So it's it's like this, it is many layers, and um, it's basically learning how to stop thinking so linear and being able to think more in a layer type understanding of it. Multi-dimensional thinking. Yeah, multi-dimensional thinking. Okay, well, I'm getting closer, feeling more and more comfortable with the, the concepts. Just more research. I guess got to go to the law library. And what, what do you start, start with? I mean, in the law library, I guess the... Causes of action. Causes of action. Causes of action and... Uh, Yep, you go. You'll find causes of action under temporary restraining order, orders or uh, uh, injunction, really. Yeah. That's well, yeah I guess causes no, of okay. action is breach of trust. Uh, causes of action, you know, unjust enrichment. You know. They'll list the causes of action. Right, and also that that brings me back to uh, I think it was uh, Rule Twenty Six, the protective order. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, now that, that goes in obviously on the private side, and that's you're basically protecting your confidential information, which is the payment. Where, where's the payment? Well, uh, protective order is on the public side. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay, so that's, I guess that's keep what, I, what I keep trying to figure out is the exact order of operations, and this is where I'm having my, I, I understand the elements, or I'm, I'm beginning to uh, figure out all the elements, but it's the order of operations. Like, I guess that's really the, the next step for me to really start feeling more confident in in this is basically your NOI, your SOI, and... You know, most people feel uncomfortable in court. Most people don't want to learn the law, but you know, the law is really your rights, and if you don't know what the law is, you don't know what your rights are. And no. anybody who based on his rights has no rights. So that's why we're all slaves. None of us know what the law is. Right. Well, what, what law are you referring to? God's law or man's law? Uh, either one, because, you know, if you don't know man's law in this world, you're still out of luck. Yeah, unfortunately. I guess that's true. But that, I have so many laws, how are you going to know them all? I mean, it's nobody knows them all. I don't need to know all 63 million of them, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess, so basically federal rules of procedure, but they're not going to go into this whole protective order, NOI, SOI, and pleading special matters. They won't, it's really, it's all hidden, it's all colored. It's, so it's like really coming up with the order of operations of how you're supposed to be doing this. Yeah, well, this, this stuff it actually becomes interesting once you start getting with the speed of it, and you start going back into it, and you see where all this law and stuff comes from. Sure. And that's what's making sense that you're actually making a connection in with your creator. Yeah. That, that's pretty, that makes sense. I mean, God's the ultimate trust. God created us. So it's, uh, 
I guess, yeah, it's just like, you know, there's the order of operations. I'm still just trying to figure that out. And the public and the private. That's the, basically the, the, you know, I understand the elements. It's now where do they fit all in, which goes public, which goes private, and in what order. Yeah, the best kind of slaves to have are slaves that don't know they're slaves, and we haven't really realized we've been slaves all our lives. Yeah, obviously. Well, yeah. Because we didn't know what our rights were, because we didn't know what the law was. Right. Because it's all been colored. It's there. It's just colored. So. Okay. Well. Yeah. All right. I'll go to the law library and study some more stuff. Basically. The, the Rule 26, though, that is a protective order, though, right? I mean, that's – and do you file that after the um, counterclaim or before the counterclaim? Uh, we've been debating that. Uh, we've got, like, split sides on that. Uh, it might be best to start it right off the bat and protect it. That way you didn't yeah, wave it. By protecting yourself yeah. first. <laughs> that's kind of actually maybe the, for the first thing you send in is a protective order to protect all the information. But that's what I don't get. In the public, nothing is protected. Everything is exposed in the public. Everything? What? Everything in the public today is general. And there's yeah. nothing general unless you claim it. So by turning in a protective order, isn't that kind of almost like pleading special matters by saying, wait, there's a protective order on this stuff. This stuff can't go into the public because there's a protective order. So yeah, you're I mean, making best of intent to keep it private. That shows your willingness to make it so that it's secret. It's it's private. So that that is almost like you're, you're pleading special matters is basically by giving protective order. That's wait, this is a special matter. Here's a protective order over this. This is private. Special matter, private. You know, it protect this, protect the public liability, and protect the public uh, from this knowledge that they haven't ascertained. Yeah, it's all colorful. Got to put in a colorful protective order on the public side. Uh, so really, the order of operations is kind of irrelevant in a way, as long as you do it. Well, you, you have to form, process, and procedure to get you in the door, so you don't get clobbered right away. You've got to come in with armor on, and then then so you can choose the second door so you can get in that way. Right. Whew. Okay. And basically, that's just by that is by you're doing your you're pleading your special matters and your counterclaim that is going to get you into equity the way you write it, and the protective order is basically your your armor. Real, real times, you know, when you had to do the jousting and you, you had to go out there and run the gauntlet. Yeah. Got to get beat up a little. <laughs> well, not if you know where all the mines are. If you went in and knew where all the mines were, you could avoid all the mines and go through safely. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I guess, yeah, yeah, this, it is studying. It's really just studying all of it and putting it, putting it together. Yeah, they say a legal fiction was the definition was that uh, it was the bleary-eyed watchers of the ancient legal treasures. Yeah, they, can't clearly. they can't see clearly. They they know you're out there, and as long as you don't kind of like wake them up with an explosion by stepping on a mine, then if you can traverse through the maze and make it through, you're there. They never uh, are the gatekeepers essentially. Yeah, the gatekeepers. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put it back out there. I would like to find an ambassador again. I'm still looking. I haven't really quite connected with everyone. I think that the problem with the ambassadorship is everybody's, you know, in theory, there, but not quite ready to bring it out completely yet. It seems like I'm working diligently on understanding or getting more clarity. I would like to find an ambassador. So if there's somebody that's, especially in the California area, I did connect with someone that was also looking for an ambassador in California, but Looking for maybe someone that's got a little bit more. Um, well, the more people we have working on, you know, we can split things up, and uh, each one studies a different section and has different ideas that they can contribute with their part. Yeah. So, uh, my my Skype is uh, Organicali, O R G A N I C A L I, Organicali, like Organic California, and. Basically, I'm on a mission to make a big agricultural uh, trust sooner or later to help restore the environment using agricultural farming methods and uh, organic medicine and organic uh, processes. 
including organic raw, but organic agriculture. All right. Okay. Well, God bless. Thank you so much. You're you're um, a beacon of light, inspiration. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Next caller. And you're unmuted. Hey, good evening, Christian. How you doing? Good, good. Great. How you uh, doing? Oh, I'm doing great. What weather's good out here? Can't complain. Uh, cool. This stuff is so cool. It's so cool. It's unbelievable. Oh, I'm not doing it yet. I'm I'm still doing better credit. All the stuff I'm you're doing right now. Better credit, yeah. Better credit, yeah. Somebody, yeah, I, that's that's good. Good. Yeah, Vanek Alley, you're still uh, on. You're not muted. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'll, I'll try again. Right. Go uh, ahead, Dan. Okay, I think what Floyd is looking for is the uh, Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act of 2009. Right, I couldn't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So it's, read it, it's, read it one more time. It's Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act of 2009. Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act 2009. Right. And then if you Google that, a bunch of things come up. And almost it. Yeah, I think you're right on their website and they got all the downloads and prints printed right on. Yeah. yeah so, and and the, the second thing I had, uh, speaking about uh, getting into equitable jurisdiction, uh, I was reading in uh, American Jurisprudence and their equity side of it. Actually, I have Corpus Juris Secundum and American Jurisprudence opened up to equity. I think in uh, American Jurisprudence, it's volume 27A and it's 30A and, and CJS. And it said there's four elements that are required to be established to establish equitable jurisdiction. Uh, it said number one was the need for discovery. Number two was the complicated nature of the account. Uh, three was the existence of a fiduciary relationship. And four was inadequacy of legal remedy. And it said uh, if you complete those four things, you should be able to get into equity. As far as, uh, uh, but that's just the general side of equity, right? There's also a special side of the equity, uh, the trust side. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, give us those four elements again. Uh, it was the need for discovery. Um, two was complicated nature of the account. Three was existence of a fiduciary relationship. And it emphasized that the fiduciary relationship was the most important element of those four. And then the fourth one was uh, inadequacy of legal remedies. What was the publication date on that? Ah, uh, crap. I didn't write that down. I think it was uh, American Jurisprudence uh, 2D, uh, Volume 27A. I, I'm going back there tomorrow. Uh, I'll get on tomorrow's call and, and give you the uh, all the information. Yeah, because the closer we get to modern times, uh, the less I, you know, go by what they say. Yeah, it, it was a newer volume. They got a brand new volume there. It's, funny, uh, th th none of the lawyers that come in and out of that law library cracked the volume of <laughs> CJS and uh, American You don't even know what equity is. <laughs> oh, th th those are the loneliest books you've ever seen. They're brand yeah, I know. new. You, you look at uh, even some but of the I'm, books that you can... As long as I've been in this, uh, listening to different people talk about different subjects, I never hear anybody talk about equity, and I never hear anybody talk about trust. And that's just the stuff we're talking about. Exactly. And and you don't see any uh, written publications or material that talk about those two at the same time. They're always right. separated as far apart as possible. And, uh, <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why. And and I, I've also been hearing that uh, uh, in the uh, law schools, trust law is now an elective. It's uh, it's I'm. My understanding, yeah. it's not even a, a critical uh, curriculum. It's just kind of like if you want to take it, it's like wood shop. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, uh, what, what does that tell you about uh, modern law trying to steer away some of these new law students away from trust and, and equity? 
but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to the law library, chugging along. It's 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 overwhelming. You, you walk in there, and I mean, it's literally like you can just peruse the shelves, catch something that's eye catching, open a book, and you can be staring, you know, reading the thing for four hours before you get to what you were actually there to look for. So it's just kind of a it's just a giant wealth of rabbit holes. You just have the time to read it all. But that's that's all I had. I just, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I came across those four elements. It, it was in American Jurisprudence. I'll, I'll, I'll track down the uh, page number in the section tomorrow. Yeah, copyright date. Copyright date. Okay, no problem. Cool. That's all I had. I like to copy. I like to take a, a modern version, like say 2000 something, and uh, look at that and compare it to say like a 1955 or 1930, you know, or something early. Okay. Compare the two. Yeah, a lot of these. Uh, actually, I just uh, grabbed a book from uh, Amazon.com. It's called uh, uh, It's called Walsh on Equity. And the reason why it caught, it caught my eye is because uh, I'm looking I'm looking at uh, definitions in Black's Law, and uh, you had a call a while back where you were saying that um, a lot of the explanations on the definition are referring to corpus juris secundum, that they're getting a lot of their footnotes and, and uh, their explanations of their legal definitions from CJS. So I was looking at some definitions on equity, and Black's Law was – was uh, footnoting uh, this guy Walsh on equity, so I just figured if Black's Law is is using this guy as a as a uh, as an authority, might might be worth worthwhile yeah. to check into it, just as CJS yeah. was wild to check into. Mm -hmm. I, I just got it delivered to me today, so I'll start reading this thing and see if there's anything useful I can yank out of it and share with you. Okay, Dan, thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Take care. Now, 718, you're unmuted again. 718? Can you hear me? Gary, huh? Who's this? That's Gary? Harold. Oh, Harold, okay. Okay. Uh, actually, um, I, I have wanted to address um, with the gentleman, um, well, I forgot his name. Um, with the lady that he was helping, but uh, Carlos, the Floyd? Uh, ex yeah, Floyd, Floyd, Floyd yeah, I, yeah. Um, but I think Carlos did an excellent job in um, giving a re immediate remedy to stop what's happening, so she can complete her process under a trust. So that's good. Uh, now, what was that volume? What was the volume on um, American jurisprudence that the, the uh, gentleman just stated? I think you said it was 27. 27 or 25. I remember it said 20 something A. Because remember, I got a I got a set of um, American jurisprudence, so I, I can. Uh, 27 later. Uh, 27 okay. or 25 then I guess. 25. Yeah. But my my set is a little older, so maybe I can. Um, have the um, the comparison. If he's looking at the new, and I have the old. Because mine is from the 80s, 80s, early 90s. Yeah, he might want to look at that one that we got off the internet, uh, off of the Google search, which was the uh, one by Palmer. I think it was about six or eight volumes. I was looking through that and equity and. Uh, that gives you some of the stuff they switched from, like the bill and equity, to the the more modern stuff what they used into the regular pleading. And that's given a kind of right there on the line where they it's kind of given both at once. So that's kind of a, a an excellent read, I'd say that Pomeroy one on equity. You say Palmer? Pomeroy, or uh, let's see. Yeah, I think it was Pomeroy. Okay. Now, because um, I, I, I like those four elements that he was just talking about, because it actually 
brings uh, equity and trust together. Yeah, I never thought that when I started studying this equity stuff that discovery was uh, under equity. Well, you know, because I, I remember reading in some of the um, American Jewish Hello, did we lose you? Hello? You can't hear me? Oh, there we go. Here, back on now. Okay. All right, I won't hold you up, um, but I just wanted to address the uh, the lady there. But um, I think uh, Carlos' approach would um, would work, and so they get everything together. So, and I commend Floyd for uh, what he's doing also on on her behalf. We need more people like that. And with that, I will uh, fade to the background and go back to work. Okay, Harold. Thank you. Appreciate Next caller, you're on mute. If anybody has a question, press star six, star one to get in the queue line. Uh, we're uh, a little break here. Uh, if anybody's going to attend the Saturday call, uh, We've made a time change for the Saturday call. It's no longer starting at 9 p.m. Eastern time. It's been bumped up one hour. We're starting at 10 p.m. Eastern on the Saturday call from here on in. So mark your schedule change there. So just the Saturday call. So Monday, Tuesday, and Saturday will all be starting at, at 10 p.m. Eastern time, same number. And the only one that's different is on Wednesday, which would be 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. So again, Saturday's call has been changed from 9, we're moved up to, to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Four seven nine, you're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> Christian, I had a question about, or this is Don in Arkansas, I had a question about uh, bank accounts. Uh, we did an experiment with the uh, depositing of a special uh, deposit with the uh -huh. local bank, <clears throat> and uh, we got a back a notice of uh, denial. And then a day a day later, they wrote a letter and said that uh, they were going to close our account. Uh, that we had to have the account reconciled and closed and if we didn't have it they would send a cashier's check on the 23rd to close the account uh, my question is is a bank account it, can it be construed as a trust or uh, expressed as a trust yeah it's it's not uh, that you what you've done is you've given a general deposit you transferred ownership of the account to them and they own the account because you you'd never express it to be a special deposit on your trust but you, you could change the nature of it, withdraw it as uh, general, and then redeposit it back as special. Is, it, is that what you did? Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, we were kind of going to discuss it with you before we uh, made our next move. Uh, but yeah. they're saying that it has to be closed by the 23rd. So what, what did you do? Did you uh, put a special deposit in? in? Is that yeah, we uh we did kind of what uh what Pete had mentioned. We uh filled out uh, a application and uh made it as a special deposit with a signature on it. And uh they sent a, a denial letter and then later sent a closed count letter. Closed uh they sent another closed account letter? Yeah, they said uh they're going to terminate the account by the 23rd. So we were wondering maybe we did something wrong or uh, do they not like messing with uh, dealing with special deposits? What's going on? Okay. What was the trust res to send them? Well, the trust res would have been our signature on the application, and that would have been a loan application. Has filled uh -huh. out and deposited special uh, deposit. How long has it been since you deposited? Uh, we did that on the second of July. Mm 
they never sent the uh, they never sent any paperwork back or anything. The original the original signature card or anything. Mm-mm, no. We're just kind of perplexed as to what we might do as far as uh, expressing, go ahead and express the trust or ask what happened to the special deposit or ask questions in, in general or what Well, I'm assuming that you probably expressed the trust already, and what they're doing is they're closing the general account, and now you've got to make sure that they complete the rest of the instructions and open it up as special. Redeposit okay. Because it's like the guardian ward uh, that we talked about about a month ago. Uh, I don't know if you uh, ever heard that tape, the guardian ward relationship. Yeah. When we terminated that, you terminated that by asking them for a, a final accounting. When you asked uh-huh. for the final accounting, that terminated the guardian ward relation. Well, it sounds like they're giving you a final accounting and terminating the general deposit. Now, if they've got the, the trust res, I would write them back and say, uh, I'm going under the assumption that you're withdrawing the thing from general deposit and doing those instructions, and now that you're going to, you're going to redeposit as now special under trust. Okay. Uh, what would the meaning of the uh, letter with uh, saying that the uh, application for loan had been denied. Is that just a public uh, expression? Does it mean anything? Yeah, that might have been just some kind of colorable way of saying something that's, that they can show on a public side. You didn't make an application uh, for loan, did you? Uh, no, we just uh, filled it out. Uh, just put our, you know, your name and uh, address and wrote on their special deposit there was no amount put on the uh, application nor there was there any information about uh employment and all that kind of crap because we figured this is a special or private affair all that stuff would be uh not needed because all right so what was the what was the paper for what did you use that for you mean the application? Uh-huh. We just used it for a special deposit and signed it and using the signature as your res on the application itself. And the whole application became when the... When did you send that in? When did you send that in? We sent that in on the, on the 2nd of July. And they responded on the 8th of July. Then on the 9th of July, they said the account I'm getting, must be closed. I'm getting conflicting information here from you. Uh, you're telling me that you formed a trust on uh, the 2nd, July 2nd, by application and signing a, a signature card. And I'm getting uh, now on the 5th, you're sending in another application for a on a loan document, and you're making a special deposit on that. No, no. We already had the account open, so all we did was fill out the application and made it a special deposit. It, which, we, application? which application? That was the loan app. The, exi- the account existed already. No, we just did a special You're doing it all wrong. You're doing it all wrong. Oh, okay. Well, that's the reason I'm questioning. Yeah. The original signature card was the special deposit. That was the formation of the trust. Uh huh. Not your other thing that you're trying to deposit in there. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That, that's the reason for calling you. We want we we wanted to uh, kind of run into what we might have done wrong. Yeah, so, are, are you saying it's it's the first signature is the trust res? Okay. And that's the one you want to claim and use as a special deposit to form the trust. Well, after you fill out the signature card, do you then write them and tell them you're going to express the trust and that's the trust res? 
Yeah, I would let that sit there for a little bit, and then when I come back in, I'm going to tell them, hey, I'm, I'm withdrawing that from general deposit under their mistake. And I want this corrected nature and character to special deposit because they're mistaken. Okay. Now, uh, say they close out the account, will they let us open a new one? I doubt it. <laughs> so we're on a blacklist now. The, uh, you go back and make sure that you've got all the elements necessary for the formation of trust and one of the methods of formation and some kind of record created that you can say that so I'm assuming you were there in person, signed a, a signature card, and gave it to them in person, right? Right. Were there any witnesses there? Uh, well, we were probably both present at the time. All right. Is there any kind of a connection between the two parties, between the two of you? Uh, we're brothers. All right. Uh, that's not as bad as husband and wife, let's say, that way. Uh, yeah, I would have had a notary go with me and have the notary hand them because I gave the card to the notary and, and the notary gave it to them. And that way I could have had the notary under his hand and seal verify that he did the presentment and the delivery of the actual document. That way I can have my affidavit sworn statement that I what I did and I did a delivery and then the notary having his Hand and seal, which is outside the hearsay rule, right. is self-authenticating his certificate that he did the presentment of the special trust res deposit to that banker. And then I would have the information, the records that I could put on the UCC one, the threes, and the county. Okay. Them so, so we have might done, be able to. Have you done the ones and the threes? We've done one, threes, but not on the bank. Okay, because those are the notices, but the notice always only points to the actual facts, and the actual facts is you actually delivered them in, in person, the actual trust res, which was the signature card signed. Uh -huh. you, you need two witnesses to that fact. If you don't have the two witnesses, I don't know whether or not you could prove it, beyond the shadow of a doubt that you made an actual special deposit that way. Uh-huh. Well, would you need to make that a special deposit at the time the notary presents it back to the banker or uh, just make it a, a, uh, a presentment and then go back and uh, declare it a special deposit after withdrawing the general deposit? Well, I'd go back and maybe just since you're two brothers, you know, you have two affidavits that you could swear to that you actually made a delivery. And delivery is one of the methods of the formation of trust. So if you hand delivered the signature card and you've got two witnesses, that should substantiate the any fact. But I like to have somebody that's like independent, you know, clean hands at arm's length. You know, notary does that excellently. Right. What about having two notaries? Would that be Sufficient to witnesses? Well, no, I, your, your affidavit and a witness uh, uh, is being the answer. Oh, okay. Okay, very good. Well, I suppose we can uh, back up and uh, try it again. Yeah, you want to think as I'm doing a withdrawal of the general deposit and I'm doing a redeposit correcting the nature of that general deposit and making it special. Uh-huh. Well, now, that, could that process be done on the existing account that they're wanting to close? Yes, because it sounds like they're closing it out from the general, but now you just have to make sure that they treat your special deposit as being special because it was a mistake. So, right, we send them thank you for your understanding that you, you, uh, you agree with me that you've made a mistake under this general deposit, and now you're correcting it, 
and it is my uh, reliance on that this is now a confidential relationship and you're going to honor my special deposit. Okay. That, that sounds like an avenue to, to go down. So that breach of trust will not have to be claimed by the beneficiary. Right. Very good. And I think probably what you've got, if you go back to the, the original signature, uh -huh. that's what it established the trust. Okay. Now, if they want to close out the general deposit, they have to return the original signature cards, and they can't do that, I don't think. Right. And that would be a breach. Uh-huh. Well, I put in there, you know, uh, I've got this, uh, I, I granted a special deposit on such and such a date that was in confidence and reliance on that it should be returned back to me sometime in the future along with all the proceeds therefrom as my interest. Okay. That's the little indenture. Okay. Sounds simple enough or easy enough. Now, once the agreement is established for a the uh, private banking, uh, then we would give them orders to uh, monetize the signature for whatever amount necessary to put in the public account so to be funds for the to use in public. Uh, yeah, you could. Okay. Well, we'll keep you posted on how this uh, shakes out. <laughs> Did you put uh, instructions with that at any place, any time after you put the card in? The uh, no, we just basically uh, wrote a note with the application stating that it was a special deposit and requested it be handled as such, and... You know, that's all I'm thinking about it. it. It's like the application that you put in there, that's more like the indenture instructions. Oh, yeah. But you didn't specify that it was your signature card that was special deposited. So, might need to back up and make that be known? Yes, you must. Okay. Well, that's... That's easy enough to do. It has to be specific trust res, and it's specific because it's specifically identifiable. Did you identify trust res? No. Right. right. So you're missing an element in formation of trust, and there is no trust. Right. You're missing the basics, and that's where I find most people fall down is on the basics. Right. The, the four elements is intent, purpose, party, specific trust res. That all has to be there, and then right. one is the formation. Well, I, I assume the mistake uh, here was assuming that the uh, application that we filled out was uh, the trust res. Yeah, that's, that, that's their mistake, but their mistake would be that they're construing this to be a general deposit, and you want to say that that's their mistake, that this is not a general deposit. It needs to be withdrawn and redeposited as special, correcting your mistake. Uh -huh. And then your mistake needs to be corrected. You need to make it clear that specific trust res was the original signature card that was given on such and such a date. Okay. This now, my if, when, so and so and so. Okay. Now, whenever we want to uh, tell them, we just write the in the letter that we write back that we're going to request that the general deposit be withdrawn. And a special deposit be made of the uh, signature card. Is that what we're going to tell them? Drawn and redeposited as special deposit. Okay. Very good. General deposit withdrawn and redeposited as a special deposit. Okay. And the relationship is to be a special relationship thereafter. Yes. Okay. Go look under. Uh, Corpus Juris Secundum under depositaries. 
and look under the yeah, section. We've been, where it we've says been reading that. General deposits and special deposits. Right. And it says to correct the nature of a general deposit, you do a withdrawal and a redeposit. Right. But now you got to instruct the puppet what to do. Make a withdrawal and a redeposit. Okay. Because they're they're making a withdrawal, but I I don't think whether I don't think they're going to do the the redeposit because number one you don't have the elements necessary to form a trust because you didn't specify what trust res was. Okay. So once we make that specification, then they'll know yeah, where to got, redeposit. You write back to them. You have to have intent, purpose, party, specific trust res, and a method of formation. If you don't have that in that indenture, you don't have a trust. Okay. You got now, a name, uh, and you got to name the beneficiary. Is it important to name the beneficiary, or can he remain nameless? He has to be identified sometime within perpetuity. Oh, okay. Now, when we do the delivery, does it need to be uh, sent with a uh, certified or a registered mail to the CFO? I don't, of the I don't do anything without registered mail with this stuff. This is private. Okay. All right. Well, like I say, we'll keep you posted. Yeah, uh, let me think. Uh, I don't remember what tape that was. It's been within the last six weeks, I'd say, right around in there where we did the, the one on the nature of the deposit. Yes, I think it was in, it was in May, actually. Okay. Uh, I'd go back over that tape. Okay. Well, well. May May eighth, two thousand ten. Yes, that's what I was thinking. And I think we did maybe like three of them in a row there, so there might be two right. others either before it or after that we kind of like reviewed it or we continued on. Right. Yes. Well, I appreciate your uh, your input. We'll see what happens. All right. Do I need to pound, push pound six to get back out of here or star six? Uh, you can, but she's probably going to need you out. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Lloyd, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Um, if Carlos is on the call tonight, um, could he uh, get a hold of me um, ASAP? Skype? Well, Skype or, yeah, Skype would be fine. Trust law. Pardon? Trust law. Oh, oh he's trust law. Okay. Very good. Capital T, capital L. What was that again? Trust law, capital T, capital L, in trust law. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Very good. Well, thank you. Eric, you're unlo uh, unmuted. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yep. Go ahead. Well, I discovered a couple of interesting things. Um, one uh, out of CJS, and one out of the um, FDIC uh, trust examination manual. Yeah. Um, and um, and of course we know the FDIC is the organization that um, bonds the banks, so they can operate in the public. And I was um I, I gleaned something out of this, and it and it um and it and it and it creates a question in my mind. Maybe maybe you can help explain it. Okay. I was looking in there um in their manual under defaults, okay? And mm -hmm. it says, in contrast to technical defaults, 
substantive events of default include the failure to make required interest principal or sinking fund payments, the bankruptcy or insolvency of the obligor, or a cross default on other obligations such as loans or other bonds. The trustee should take timely and appropriate actions to ensure that bondholders realize the maximum amount of repayment of principal and interest due. Failure on the part of the trustees to act on the bondholder's behalf could result in bondholder claims that the trustee, through negligence, caused monetary losses and seek reimbursement of those losses. Now, out of that paragraph, the word that jumps out at me is substantive. Right. Okay? And if the FDIC is looking for things to ensure on the public side in the fiction and the uh, – and where they can, where the, and, the, and the side where they color on our titles, why are they looking for any substantive events? Okay, the substantive they're talking about there is in the public, and it's really not the substantive in the private. Because if you think about the title that's being acted on, it's only the legal title, it's not the beneficial title. So in this context, this is a, uh, a substantive event of legal obligation? Uh, on the public side, portal words. Okay. It involves the legal title and not the beneficial title. All right. Well, that answers that. So, um, so that maybe that'll help everybody when they're looking at stuff through the, uh, through the eyes of the public and trying to see it. On the private side, maybe they'll they'll actually see what uh, what the standard means on that. Title. I think what title is it being applied to? Right. Right, because some of that can be so confusing. It's uh, it's a maze. I know. All right, and the other thing I discovered was on um, page 472 of CJS book number 90 um, under uh, subsection 303. Um, it is a fraud in law for the trustee to purchase the trust property and making uh, of such purchase is misconduct, such purpose being – or purchase being fraudulent as inevitably creating conflict of interest between trustee personally and trust beneficiaries or at least inciting or affording opportunity for motive on his part to take advantage of his superior knowledge acquired in trust capacity, which may induce him to conceal information from beneficiaries are failed to employ it exclusively for their benefit while they rely on him scrupulously to devote himself to the furtherance of their welfare. What section is that again? Uh, 303, page 472, book 90. Is that under the uh, trustee in general? Hmm. The 303 heading. The 303 heading, I'm looking. Um, trustee in general heading, yeah. It's on the next page. Huh? Yeah, probably from himself at his own sale. Right. And what jumps out about me is that's a fraud in law, not at law. Right. Which we could also say, could we say fraud in equity? Would that be another um, way to say that? So yeah. Okay. And so what that got? I was I was talking to a friend about to me about this, and uh, you know, because he, he looks at it through like I guess most people look at um, what the banks are doing to most people when they when they employ uh, tactics like this. And when I told him what that what that definition was, and he said. Well, so you mean like they get us to buy the house at a much higher price with their superior knowledge on the inside, and then they find ways to um, to stress us out financially through all their, their manipulations of the public and the economy, and then they use their superior knowledge to take the house from us. Welcome to boom and bust. Right. Exactly. Welcome to commerce. Right. So, Welcome um, to time. Welcome to a cheap. Especially if the banks are just um, agents for the federal, for the for the treasury anyway on the public side. Mm -hmm. 
especially if they're just simply agents thereof. So, so when I when I looked at this, I thought to myself, so by um, having the SOI, the record, to uh, flip the titles to make them the trustee and make us the beneficiary, the one with the right to take, well, now they have a uh, obligation, a legal responsibility to operate exclusively for our benefit because, in fact, we are going to rely on them scrupulously to devote themselves to the furtherance of our welfare. Yeah, but we never expressed it to be a trust, never gave them a duty, and they don't have to perform until we do. And well, when I was reading, I was reading the stuff out of the FDIC manual and realizing how the banks, everything they do is in trust. And once we do have the, the SOI, as you just said, once we do uh, have the records to express a trust, because they know that they everything they do is so deeply entrenched and, and inherently um, an operation to trust, they know exactly what they have to do because they have to operate on behalf of the beneficiary. They know they, know they have to. So, so really this should be a pretty uh, simple thing once we – once we get our uh, our process down properly, and and I was um, so I was thinking about once we we start putting this to work and, and get several stories of uh, of application and results, we're gonna our our our, our abilities in this is going to grow to the point to where we're going to be coming be doing more intricate things on the private um, for bigger and bigger results. I think right now I think we're just uh, we're just trying to find some application and um, and process to where we know it will come out and work for us. But but really with the way – when I look at the FDIC manual and for all the things that they do on the public side and the colorful side, I think to myself, of all the things that we might be able to do on the private side, and uh, and that's what I, I mirror from that. Yeah, the private side controls and they're getting you to do it. They're working and manipulating you to do it for them. You're the only one that controls everything. But yet you your sleep is a puppet. Welcome to the age of majority. You just woke up. And I was going to mention about the taking there, uh, but you had mentioned it already. They don't have the right to take, but yet they do take. That was a breach. But only once we have the records to express. Yep, yep. And I hope that for everybody who's listening on the call now and will listen to this recording in the future, that they they go to the FDI website, FDIC website, and they look at the uh, trust examination manual, not to learn how to do things. Are we losing? Huh? Hello, hello. Still there? I'm still here. Back my little mouth. Hello, hello? You must have cut out there. You're still on, though. Talking to me, Christian? Can you still hear us, Eric? I can. Uh, let me send you a message. Can you hear me? Christian? Daniel, you're unmuted. Hello, Christian. Okay, Daniel, are you unmuted? You you're you're unmuting me? yourself. She's unmuting you for you, so don't click it again. Uh, I'm not pressing anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. Oh, yeah, uh, well, I, I could hear Eric loud and clear. I, I think I think uh, you two lost the connection, or you lost his connection, I think. Uh, I was hearing him just fine, um, but... It, do you want to try to get him back on? He was in the middle of something. Uh, can you get him back on? He's still he can talk. He said he's on. How about it, guys? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. All right. And, and what I was what I was getting at was is um, so many people out there are trying to get an idea of what a trust might actually look like, um, and hopefully, what we can do is take some of this stuff from the trust examination manual that's I 
and, and somebody gave this to me, and I think it's on the FDIC's website because it looks like it was printed right from it. But well, I, um, I, I can answer that. You know, what does a trust look like? A trust is invisible. You can't see it. It's a right, a duty. Well, maybe I maybe I didn't term that properly. To get some ideas about how they do it in the public in order to give us ideas of what we, we might be able to grow into in the private. Maybe that would have been the better the better way to say it. Okay. Because um, when you look at this, you think to yourself the possibilities of what could actually be with uh, and how much we can actually create, just like they do on the – on the, actually, on both the public and the private side that the banks are doing already. And, uh, and it also teaches you, when you look at this manual, how much they're, they, they or not how much, but a, a glimpse of what they, they might really be doing that we, we're not even aware of. And I, and I think for us to have some awareness of that might help us to be uh, more motivated and confident in our abilities and our, and our studies. Yeah, because everything you're doing in the public really stems from the private. And um, and while I I've been reading my my CJS trust book and and uh, I I really didn't think about it in terms of how the banks might be able to do things for us and the type of ways they uh, if we speak the right language they're going to know right away what they're going to try to deny it and I think a lot of people have a fear that the banks are going to not deny it the only thing that they I think they're scared of is people that are come in or that are incompetent and that they uh, they may put the the trustees that um, that we have the records for. Uh, that we might put those trustees in some place of liability because we don't know what we're doing, and that I think that's probably their greatest fear. Yeah, they like to be in control of things, and now that the, you know, when you start waking up, now they're not in control. You are. They might not like that, but anyway. Well, in, in looking at this, it looks like. You know, the uh, the banks have the ability to do all types of uh, certificate and uh, all types of uh, all types of document issues on behalf of of a trust, and mm -hmm. we can employ them as our agents to do yeah. all type of uh, financial transactions for us on the public side, and uh, and really and possibly have some some vast and powerful effect out there. Right. Uh, but of course, from the private, as you've said many times, control the public from the private. So. Um, hopefully, over the uh, over, over time, we'll we'll grow in our studies, and and maybe we can talk about this some more, and and maybe share a little bit more, just to give some people some some ideas on what's in this manual. And I I'd like to encourage everybody to uh, to go out there and search for it. I'll see if I can find uh, it on the internet myself because it was it was given to me as a printed document. All right, sounds good. Hey, Christian, this is Dan. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, I think it was Harold. He wanted to know what volume of uh, American jurisprudence that was. Twenty-seven A, as in Adam. Twenty-seven A. Okay. Well, I'll make it, I'll make it all. And, and also, something else occurred to me. Um, on one of those four elements uh, to establish equitable jurisdiction in, in a non-foreclosure state, um, a uh, trustee sale is virtually a, a summary judgment against you. So. Just by that virtue alone, uh, that's an inadequacy of a legal remedy, and that's that's something you can use, I believe, to convert uh, at least to get into equity, and um, and also the need for discovery, which was the first element of those four. Well, the banks are holding all of the uh, you know documentation, accounting, and uh, all the pertinent uh, documents you know regarding your account, so they're holding all of them. So the need for discovery would be equitable there as well. So in a non-judicial foreclosure state, uh, those four elements fit in really well. I think if we can piece together a, a proper pleading. And, uh, Let's go back and say there's a non-judicial state, and they they give you the notice and things. Uh, sounds like they're doing an Administrative Procedures Act type of uh, process on you, and you're not responding, and you're defaulting, and you had a chance to respond, but you didn't. Right. Exactly. Well, this is all assuming that you're proactive and you're responding. Yeah. Well, most people don't. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's. Uh, yeah. We've all been there, and I've been there, and it's uh, when when you're new to it, that the fear is 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 like paralysis, and uh, the, the the fear pretty much catches you like a deer in headlights, 
and uh, if it's your first go around, you're going to just stiffen up and get run over. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we can't be a possum because when you stiffen up, you lose. That's the problem, though. Is the fear is instinctual, and uh, when they're coming after your house and you're you're afraid of losing it, and you're afraid of you know. Uh, Islands are deadly. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's just the, the, we all think the oh. silence. Be silent, it'll, be, it'll go away somehow. But uh, how could if you go silent and do nothing? How do you expect anything's going to change? It, it isn't. Well, it, it isn't exactly. It's, I'm not saying anything's going to change. I'm just, I'm just kind of saying that uh, for 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 people who are, you know, just getting into this or just losing. And their most home. people don't get proactive and start trying to find something that they can do. They just like want to totally forget it, and maybe it'll just go away miraculously. Right. Well, that that goes along with the fear when you're afraid. Uh, uh, you don't start to look at this huge. I think vast vortex, and you don't even know how to put a dent in it. So, just psychologically speaking, that, that's what I experienced. And, but once you lose it all, you don't really care. <laughs> you got time to go to law library or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, also on the the, the 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 caller who was talking about the bank account. Um, now, if if you express it to be a trust on the signature card by signing by grantor, and then maybe even writing. Trust res on the uh, on that card or whatever that document is. Would you still need a witness or two witnesses at that point? Yeah, you need some kind of uh, way of proving it. Some kind of record. So you need some kind of. What's again? The the card itself says grantor on it. You know, if the card itself said grantor on it, had he signed that way, would would that? Yeah, but do you have a copy of it? Yeah. How are you gonna prove it? You don't. You don't even have a copy of it. Right. Right. That's true. You know, because when when you when they lose the note in a mortgage, in order for them to come up and say we want to reform the note, then they gotta have at least a copy. Right. To be able to prove that they had it in their possession at the time that they lost it. All right, that, that's all I had. Uh, I'll let you go to bed. So that works with us as well as them. I'm sorry, what was that? So that works as well as with us as it does with them. Right. That's true. Also, I was thinking with that fella, uh, you know, I might want to get in the uh, co-trustee to be, say, the bank president, the CEO of the bank. Okay. And, uh, you, you know, instead of involving uh, family members, I was thinking if we just took, like, one or two of our very good friends and started making them trustees or, or just beneficiaries of our of our property and vice versa, uh, it, it seems to me in equity the, the – uh, if, if we were to completely transfer beneficial interest to, uh, you know, good friends or neighbors or whatever, that, that, that does that does that hold more weight instead of making people in the immediate family the beneficiaries? No. No. Because uh, I, I figured if, if if we if we take the beneficial interest and push it away from us as grantors as far as possible, then it just looks like we're not really. We're we're not really in it for ourselves. We're actually sharing our property with our friends and loved ones. It's, it's not a it's not a, a self preservation or trying to hold on to my property type of thing. I'm, I'm freely sharing it with friends and family. And, uh, it's not I'm serving a self interest. Is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh... I don't know how that has like slipped my mind on that one. Uh, anyway, well, it's getting late, Christian. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you end this. That's all I had. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thank you.
Carlos, you're unmuted. Hi, Christian, I'm back. That is real dangerous. I know someone that had a, they did exactly what this gentleman said. They shared or they transferred or conveyed their interest into someone else. Guess what? The other person got sued and the, the owner lost everything. Well, that's a real big no. That's why God created land trust and trust system, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, a, in a land trust, nobody owns it. So if nobody owns anything, nobody gets sued. Makes a lot of sense. And that's the biggest no-no, I think. And uh, I have had the same question asked over and over again. I know people who own a lot of properties. They're running the big risk, and I tell them, you don't even have the slightest idea. There's a time bomb. In, in, in the whole world, especially in the United States, it's about suing each other. Yeah. And anyway, anyway, I don't want to make a long story out of this, but what I wanted to make a point before before I, I just call back for now, when when we need a, a living trust, we were talking about that in the book, right? We, are living, we need a living trust. Everybody needs a living trust. I already said, that, said this, and I'm going to repeat it. A couple needs, a, a married couple needs two trusts, two living trusts. They need to put their property in a land trust, and the beneficiary is the living trust. We have multiple um, shields. Is that simple, Emma? I think that's very simple, right? Did I explain it right? Is it comprehensible? That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, it depends whether everybody, you know, mines a stone or whether they're a sponge. <laughs> well, it's real simple. You, you don't want to, you want to control everything, own nothing, right? If you own a property, you better protect it, right? I mean, you, you don't know. There's an accident, you're liable. You, anything on your name, it's you're liable. So if you want to die, you also don't want to leave it to the government. So therefore, we place it, convey it into a land trust, and the beneficiary is a living trust. So we have two trusts protecting us. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Christian. Good night. Yeah, thanks, Carlos. Jacob, you're unmuted. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Can you hear me? I hear you. Um, I've got a special. Okay. Um, um, there's a another party listening in with me on my uh, pre conferencing line, and they don't have a microphone, okay? So I wanted to ask you a couple questions that they had asked. They have a court case tomorrow. It's a young man that has come to the age of majority. He's about 25. And um, there was a family. Uh, dispute where um, um, living in the house, the guy uh, didn't follow the uh, house rules as a renter uh, and um, got kicked out of the house and then he brought a action for some really rude uh, you know some homeland security hoop to do family uh, disgruntled member or whatever they call it uh, matter and so he has to go to court tomorrow and he and um he's going to he he missed the uh the trial so there's going to be a uh, police officer coming over to pick him up in the morning to bring him over to the trial it's kind of a friendly neighborhood it's not like the regular us anyway um so he's wondering you know um how he should approach this um and i wanted you to be able to give a um some advice, if you would. No, I can't give advice, and I don't really know how to approach that one. Okay, well then, um, what I told him what I would have do if I was in his shoes is that um, um, I would go in there, and um, they're going to, you know, they're going to misconstrue him as the defendant. Okay. And there's really no party of in, there's no party that has been injured. And, um, therefore, 
Um, he's been studying quite a bit on the program, Christian, okay? And um, um, I just, uh, when, we, when we go into court on a whatever, uh, you know, some kind of matter, a traffic ticket or some kind of action or what have you, uh, when we're going in there uh, being con misconstrued under that guardianship ward relationship, um, how, you know, how, how, how are we to express ourselves um, as uh, being a grantor in the courtroom as opposed to being a defendant? The only other thing they give at you is a offer for a general deposit or a special deposit, and it's up to you. You make the choice. If it's already been deposited, it's already a general deposit set up, then you got to withdraw it and redeposit it as special. If it's a brand new set up, you got the choice right then and there whether it's going to be a general deposit or a special deposit. That's two options you got. Well, it's okay. So in this case, the uh, party brought a uh, frivolous action against them. There was no injury, so that was a uh, – general deposit. There's now a case number which would be construed as a general deposit because it hasn't been um, construed as a special deposit. They need to change its deposit Correct. nature from general to special. If he has, if, but if he, okay, so if, if this thing is taking place tomorrow, then um, how in the heck uh, would he be able to create records to prove he had a trust? He would have to express it, you know, I, in the I, court. Uh, how is it going? So, that's the answer right there. He needs to create records. Now, okay. why, are you ask, why are you asking me that? Yeah, I got that. He needs to be No, I, I mean, how do you do it in one day when you're going in? I don't know. You, okay. You answer, you're right. How do you do it in one day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got it. Um, well, there's uh, I guess what he's going to be going up against is a contempt charge for missing the trial date because uh, the ride that he had there, uh, somehow he got discombobulated and he had to hitchhike, and then he actually got there late, and the judge did see him sitting up in the next case in the uh, stadium there. And so uh, I think it's going to be a, uh, you know, you uh, – um, um, how, how does one, when they walk into court, who don't have records, express that they're not in a ward relationship? Maybe that would be the question. Well, when I'm going to be walking into a court, I'm going to have all the documentation already done. And when I walk into court, the only thing, reason I'm going to be there is to grant my name and establish myself as a grantor in fact. And I'm going to be asking the judge, what did you do with my special deposit? Has it been ledgered property for extinguishment of the debt? Because if it hasn't, then I'm here to implement a breach of trust. Okay. Okay, thank you, Christian. That's what I would do. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Okay, folks, it's almost 1 o'clock. Right. So that's it for tonight. Thank you for all joining me. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And don't forget, next Saturday is not at 9 p.m. as usual. We've moved it up one hour, and it's now starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Time.